from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'd like to welcome all of you to the European Division. Uh, my name is Kenneth Nirati. I am the specialist for Hungary. Uh, Grant Harris, the head of the reading room, regrets that he can't be here to, today to introduce a speaker. Uh, born in Vienna, Austria. <laughs> uh, Kurt Bednar graduated from the University of Vienna Faculty of Law in 1974. He has found employment with governments and chambers of commerce as well as entre entrepreneurial positions in fields such as databases, data protection, and company pensions. He graduated from the University of Vienna a second time in 2012 with a doctorate from the Faculty of Philosophy, Department of History, based on a thesis entitled, Emigration from Austria-Hungary to the USA between 1900 and 1930. This work will appear in book form by the end of this year. He has published books on computing in the construction industry, data protection laws, and company pensions. And two of his books are available here at the Library of Congress. And their in titles are in German, and I won't dare try to pronounce them. He has written numerous articles dealing with law and related fields. He has published his first book review last year. He is also a member of the Scientific Advisory Board for the House of Austrian History to be established in Lower Austria and to be opened by the end of 2017. The title of this presentation today is Frederick Cortland Penfield, Last and Undervalued U.S. Minister to Habsburg Vienna in Crisis 1913 to 1917. It is my honor to introduce to you Dr. Kurt Bednar. Thank you very much for coming and uh, Mr. Ariway with the uh, the map of the monarchy, uh, long gone, and we quickly changed to the man of this hour, F Frederick Cortland Penfield. When Woodrow Wilson, uh, President of the United States of America, wrote a letter to Franz Josef I, Emperor of Austria, dated uh, July 29, 1913, he announced the arrival of Frederick Cortland Penfield to reside near the government of His Majesty as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary. He had chosen this distinguished citizen as well informed of the relative interests of the two countries. As a matter of fact, Penfield had been Wilson's second choice. His first choice, Egan, had refused to accept the post in Vienna since life in Vienna would be quite expensive. In fact, Penfield was chosen because he was a Catholic, and he had no idea what he was up to. As soon as Vienna learned of the probable nomination of Penfield, Austrian ambassador Dumba was asked to look around. He had New York Council General Nuber inquire as Penfield at that time lived in New York. The information Vienna received was pleasing enough. According to Nuber's telegram, Penfield, 58, was a journalist, explorer, writer of distinguished appearance and, due to studies in Germany, mastering German. His wife was also Catholic and wealthy, some 30 million US dollars, which had resulted in the richest contribution to the latest democratic ticket. A short notice in the German-speaking New York Staatszeitung, at that time a uh, relatively high, uh, large number of newspapers was published in German, of June 26, speculated that as he was wealthy, he ought to be able to become the most radiant diplomatic representative of the new U.S. administration, which of course pleased the Vienna court eager for splendor and recognition. In 1916, Penfield complained to Wilbur Carr, director of the consular service at that time, that he paid 24,000 US dollars for his residence of 60 rooms, 
among them a dining room hosting up to 60 guests. The American Embassy in Vienna even furnished Austria's Foreign Minister Count Berchtold with some sort of curriculum vitae of Penfield. This one-page document also registered the awards showered upon him by countries like England, France, Turkey and Serbia. The official dictionary of American biography described his public career. It has brought him to London and Cairo, where he must have spent the high time of his life, as his two books, Present Day Egypt and East of Suez, written in the 16 years between Cairo and Vienna, deal with that oriental country. Earlier had already earned his living by writing. He spent his junior years in the staff of a Hartford newspaper. There are not many sources on Mrs. Penfield, but the few available mark her as an open-minded and general personality. During her stay in Vienna, she took German lessons in Baden near Vienna. Her teacher, Gustav Braun, Luisenstrasse 22, was proud portrait with his prominent and obviously ambitious pupil. When reading the thank you card, no problem. <laughs> One wonders how good a teacher she picked, as he signed as Herr Sprachlehrer, if you look at the last one, without an H. <laughs> <Dear Jesus. laughs> Back home, Mrs. Penfield excelled as a generous donator, not only to the Pennsylvania Historical Society. Upon the death of her husband in 1922, she received a letter from Colonel House in which the formerly trusted advisor of Woodrow Wilson expected that history will do him justice. This history has still to happen. Among other authors, Rachel West in particular accuses Penfield, described as an ambassador elsewhere, of several flaws. First of all, Penfield is conceited to a fault and could strut sitting down. <laughs> but this is hearsay. The source Gru, who had worked in Vienna before, probably didn't like him. In the end, we will hear why. Secondly, Penfield never lost his fondness for boasting. Finally, West deplores the bad quality of his reports, mocking topics like cholera and the health of the emperor, especially that he did not foresee the coming disaster. In truth, as we all know, the war caught Penfield, like most of other U.S. representatives in Europe and many other people, by surprise. His first job now was to support Americans getting out of the country, if they so wished. Altogether, it's estimated that about 50,000 Americans stranded in Europe in 1914. In that era, passports were the exception of the rule. His staff had to identify Americans, issue proper travel papers, and provide such donors with cash. Obviously, enough ships were available in Europe to return all Americans. Several months into the war, Penfield suffered from a growing shortage of personnel. A young Austrian, aged 25, with the name Leo Fröschl from Mistelbach, north of Vienna, was called to the colors. He happened to be working for Penfield as second gardener. After the ambassador had already lost seven servants to the Austrian army, he contacted uh, Bertolt, the foreign minister, stating, I can't very well live in Vienna as an ambassador unless allowed some servants. Penfield also put in a good word for his chief gardener, Johann Prohaska, 35, his chief butler, Ernst Wieninger, 38, they're all mentioned in this paper, and the house servant, Albert Jurgina, aged 24. Him he regarded as too tall and fragile to make a soldier. And Fröschl is so nearly stone deaf that I'm sure he would make a poor warrior. He is, however, a good worker in my glass houses, and I wish the war ministry would send him back. Minister Berchtold supported the desire. As the US kept the difficult course of neutrality, America was approached by belligerents to represent their interests towards respective foes. Thus, Penfield had to inspect prisoner camps in Austria on behalf of Italy, which had declared war on Austria in May 1915. On February 28, 1916, he did inspect Katzenau, a site in a Linz suburb. Frankly speaking, I haven't had before, learned before of this place 
before I came across his document. Pen <laughs> Typical Viennese would say. Penfield was in the company of two of his staff, naval attaché Graham and his private secretary Gardeza, and a Baron Freudenthal, Austrian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Katzenau at that time only sheltered civil prisoners, enemy aliens. Camp director Baron Reicher was also a civilian. According to the report of March 14th, US inspectors checked menus and daily rations as well as tasted the milk, sweet and of good quality, produced by some 50 cows near the camp. The whole food supply was managed by a committee of five selected among the internees. Any inhabitant was free to grab food somewhere else. There was a canteen and private Austrian shops on the grounds. But alcohol was restricted to one liter of beer and half a liter of wine per day. <laughs> what a restriction. <laughs> Altogether, the camp's capacity was estimated up to 5,600 persons. On the day of inspection, Katzenau had 4,300 inmates, 3,300 of which were Italians. Sanitation and cleanliness were observed by a medical chief named Bertomini, obviously of Italian background. The doctor testified to the US group that no contagious diseases had occurred recently. Money was not allowed in Katzenau. Instead of cash, which landed in a depot, people received Lagergeld, camp, camp money, and that currency worked everywhere in Katzenau, but nowhere outside, thus keeping inmates from trying to escape. Overall, the report resumed no serious complaints. From the beginning of the conflict, Penfield had sent voluminous reports from his office in Vienna to U.S. Secretary of State Lansing and Colonel House in Washington and New York, respectively. On January 28, 1915, he sent a report to Bryan, when still Secretary of State, about the first six months of the war. Penfield's central observation was a lack of impartial information since authorities installed censorship and forbade foreign newspapers. What is striking in his, is his finding of early war weariness in the population. Vienna itself was full of disabled soldiers and fleeing civilians. Quite importantly, Penfield already seemed to have good contacts to the court, as the new foreign minister, Czernin, kept the Americans inf American informed about the good health of the emperor. His report referred to four American military observers at the front, two of whom, Major Ford and Captain McIntyre, narrowly escaped from Belgrade when it was taken over by the Serbs again, a third being in Galicia, which is up, up to the <coughs> up north, and the fourth active in Pula, which is, uh, the, was the Austrian uh, naval uh, center in the Adriatic. The first war loan in Austria raised good money, if at an interest rate of 5%. However, at international markets, Austria would have to pay interest up to 10%. Sorry, 5, 3 quarter and up to 10% they would have paid on the free market. Penfield deplored the lack of social life in the Austrian capital, although the well-noticed character of the Viennese coffee house as yet could be upheld. People at Hort abhorred French and English, and Americans had a hard time to explain that they are different from perfidious Albion. <laughs> the city seemed, this is quote <laughs> from his, the city seemed to be able to keep normal supply with food, however. Private cars had disappeared also because tires could not be found anywhere. In the documents in the Vienna State Archive, you can find uh, several requests from Penfield uh, for tire and for uh, gasoline. And sometimes he got some, but he had a hard time. Penfield thought most Americans had left Austria with just 200 and 250 persons staying by their own choice or for business. So joining in Tyrol or studying theology in Innsbruck. I didn't find out who it was. <laughs> a truly comprehensive document followed by a report titled Austria-Hungary after a year of war, dated July 29, 1915. What is remarkable is a receiver of this. The envelope was addressed to Mrs. Richard Myers in Philadelphia, who was Mrs. Penfield's favorite niece. The report had several sections, Italy's entrance into the war, the estimated number of soldiers fighting for Austria-Hungary, human care of prisoners, 
evidences of racial differences of opinion, controlling the consumption of staple foods, expedients for raising war necessaries, warnings, waning supplies of cotton and rubber, and war's crushing costs. Meanwhile, Lansing had replaced Brian and obviously introduced his own idea of reporting. Intervals shortened, different structure compulsory. Papers include Penfield summations dated November 11, November 25, December 9, all in 1915, to be followed by a document of January 2nd of 1916, the last report in the files of the Pennsylvania Historical Society. Addressed, my dear Mr. Secretary, but not printed, not printed in the Lansing papers. It completely covered the Ancona affair and displayed a functionary aware of the practice of Austrian bureaucracy. I'm sure, you, if you're not aware, Ancona was the the ship that was torpedoed by an Austrian uh, submarine. Uh, it was actually a German submarine, but it was under the, Aust uh, under the Austrian uh, war flag. On November 19, 1915, Penfield questioned the new Foreign Minister Burian, who insisted that Austria had a right to sink enemy ships, but also promised to inquire internally for more facts. After five days, November 25th, the American, already suspecting official procrastination, asked again to see Burian. When Penfield referred to his instructions regarding promptness, Burian again asked for a few more days. When Penfield wanted assurance that it was indeed an Austrian submarine that sank the Ancona, Burian weakly admitted that this in a vague manner, continuing that the war could be over, would not America ship munitions to the Allies. Penfield, who set a sort of ultimatum on December 1st, in the meantime had received a note of protest from Washington to deliver to the foreign ministry in Vienna. At the next meeting, December 9, he handed over the first protest note. Around Christmas of 1915, it looked like severance of the relations between both states, and Penfield even issued a call to all US diplomats in the monarchy to get prepared for departure. Penfield, however, stayed for another year and continued with his reports from Vienna. These came in two versions, shorter both by length and by interval to Lansing, whereas comprehensive half-year summations were addressed mainly to Colin House, with whom he developed a warmer relationship. His first memo in the collection of House papers at Yale was dated January 28, 1916. It carried the title Austria-Hungary after 18 months of war and would be succeeded by two more memos of same structure and description covering two years of war, dated July 28, 1916, and 30 months of war, dated January 28, 1917. Subsequently, reports from Vienna were not possible as the relations were broken up. Stowald at the US legation in Bern continued with memos about the dual monarchy. Penfield's first reports, printed in the federal records of uh, foreign relations of the U.S., called FRUS, dated November 4, 1915, pursuant to your request for frequent confidential and personal letters, contained one significant piece of information, one very material piece of information indeed. Vienna was not going to nominate a successor of Dumba, who had been expelled, all too soon so long as private communication with Vienna was impossible, to send an ambassador to Washington would be worse than useless. This topic repeated itself in the later message of June 15, 1916, when Penfield assumed this government will take no action in that direction until the war is over. Three times Wilson himself reacted to the reports shown by Lansing, but his comments probably reached Lansing only. On July 27, 1916, on the report dated July 3, 1916, Wilson finally spent praise on his ambassador in Vienna. He always says something that is useful to keep in mind. The late January 1916 memo from Vienna, not fit to print in FRUS to House, commenced with the conclusion that even 18 months could not starve the monarchy, thus contradicting earlier hints of war weariness. Food seemed to be distributed effectively, although people did suffer from potato and meat shortage. Two days a week, meat was not allowed to be sold. And butter has become a luxury of the rich. Outlook to future harvests and transports from Romania and Hungary looked dim. Women and children, but also Russian and Serbian prisoners of war, had to help out. The 24 pages made more closed with a short paragraph titled Good Health of the Emperor. Foreign Minister Burian 
had just a short Penfield that the, Ma the Majesty was never better in his 86th year. Franz Josef still began his work at four o'clock in the morning and took the keenest interest in every phase of the campaign. Further reports from Vienna contained even more pages. July 28, 1916, two years of war, consisted of 34 pages. January 28, 1917, end of 30 months of war, even of 44 pages. With Penfield leaving town in April 1917, he strangely disappeared into oblivion. The inquiry, the group uh, set up by Colin House on, uh, on, upon request by President Wilson, set up to prepare for a peace conference, did not bother to interview him. On August 18, 1917, Penfield claimed still to receive confidential and extremely reliable information from Vienna. In a reply of August 28, 1917, Colonel House, who was respons responsible for the inquiry, thanked earlier let for earlier letters Penfield had written to him. House considered that the ex-ambassador had said about Austria, what the ex-ambassador had said about Austria exceedingly interesting, and referred to a meeting with Lansing, who will have passed the message on to the president himself, to whom you have given the benefit of your views. Maybe, maybe they got together in September when the houses will have been running up for a day from New York. In the meantime, the Penfields had settled down in Mamoronek in upstate New York. But one can read between the lines, he was gone. Nevertheless, between the two men, the undervalued writer turned dip into diplomat, and the influential alter ego of the president himself must have existed a, heart of fr a kind of friendship. In the House Papers collection at Yale, one may find correspondence from February 13 till fall of 1917. It begins with a performance of Cyrano at the Metropolitan Opera. Penfield, living on Fifth Avenue, invites House, 35th Street, for dinner at 7. The invitation closes with the remark that he promises not to appear in the attitude of a candidate for a place in the cabinet. Was Penfield under discussion to become a minister? Certainly House would have been the man to influence the newly, newly elected Woodrow Wilson, re-elected, uh, when forming his first cabinet. No, elected, sorry. On July 23, 1913, Penfield thanked House for his good wishes upon his appointment formerly on July 28th, to the ambassadorship in Vienna, which, so he claimed, it is the position I most coveted, admitting that it might have helped that the ambassadorial couple was Catholic. He was received by Franz Josef only in September because he was, uh, Penfield was vacationing in Karlsbad in the summer, and Franz Josef, as usual, was in Bad Ischl, of course. Not before January 18, 1915, do we read another correspondence? House announces yet another trip to Europe, sailing on the Lusitania on January 30, which was four months before it sank, was torpedoed, which by now has become war area. House asks for information from Vienna sent to his first stop London, as it might become opportune for him to travel to Vienna. Penfield, who obviously had no idea of House's mission, replies on February 11, actually warmly recommending Vienna as the most normal yet tensest of all the war capitals. It houses 50,000 wounded soldiers, 150,000 refugees from Galicia, and 1,000 Russian prisoners, but the Kaiserstadt is comfortable and safe. As we know, Haus never made it to Vienna, but on March 20, in a note from the US Embassy in Berlin, Haus invites Penfield to come over to him, since he refers to important reasons not to go to Vienna, and on the other hand, he welcomes Penfield's advice. Another letter of House to Vienna, March 9 or 10, with news from Washington about another reshuffle in diplomacy, as Morgenthau leaves Constantinople to be replaced by a man called Elkus. Elkus. Penfield reacts with the letter of April 13, commenting on the situation in Constantinople and hoping for a stopover of Elkus in Vienna on his way to Constantinople. Finally, he reclaims that our efforts and labors are recognized and appreciated not only there, but also by governments he is representing in Vienna due to the war. Thus, thus far, we seem to have made not one mistake. To steer a great embassy in this exacting capital, where our neutrality is often doubted, is a task admitting of no neglect. On April 15, 1916, Penfield uttered a confidential and surprising request to, to switch to Paris 
if the ambassador there, you sharp, retired, House must have given him this idea, according to, his, uh, to this wording. Did he build up his story in the letter of April 13? It took House until May 11 to answer both April messages from Vienna. Wilson and Lansing seemed not to appreciate a direct switch from one belligerent to another. Next, June 5th. Only on the last page of an unusually long letter did Penfield recall the intended switch to Paris and admits your judgment is perfect and it was my idea all the time. Beforehand, Penfield wrote about mediation. Our president may not be the best mediator. Austria prefers the King of Spain. And if that does not work, him together with Wilson. Even the Pope wouldn't do, as people here prefer as peacemaker a potentate whose influence is more than spiritual. Austria does not feel comfortable with Wilson's ideas, especially the right of every race to govern itself, which might conflict with the interest of a monarch ruling Austrians, Hungarians, Bohemians, Slavs, Croats, and other races. Penfield's next letter of September 19 deals with the financial contribution to the election campaign, but you need make no accounting of it. Only one day later, one may find yet another three-page message to the dear colonel covering Penfield's experience with the new ambassador to Constantinople, Elkers, who did accept his invitation to stop over in Vienna on his way to, to, to the Ottoman capital, joyful as he was an event, dragging 10 people and 50 trunks with him, joining his host at the Vienna Opera as well as at a chat with Austria's foreign minister Burian. On the other hand, against his advice, Elkers gave interviews both in Vienna and Budapest. Budapest. <laughs> his campaign contribution is acknowledged by House in his letter of October 25, together with a promise that it will not appear until the final summary in November. Then the election. Penfield on November 22 indulges in schadenfreude that all papers in this monarchy for two days paraded the news of the election of Mr. Hughes and certain important Vienna journals let loose afresh their floodgates of Wilson abuse. Meanwhile, the emperor has passed away and Penfield claims to have received probably his last picture taken shortly before his death and presented to him with an affectionate inscription. Penfield claims not only the new Kaiser and his wife Sita as close friends of himself and Mrs. Penfield, but also and especially ex-minister Berthold, perhaps my closest friend here who now works in the staff of the new emperor. In another correspondence, we meet the influential Chicago industrialist Crane. On, Crane was very important. He brought, he brought uh, Masaryk and Wilson together. Uh, was very influential. On April 26, 1916, he answers Charles Crane on behalf of Alice Masaryk, for whom he has intervened, April 22. Penfield even interviewed with Foreign Minister Burian on behalf of her and received the following information. She is being held here on a charge of high treason. Half a year later, Crane contributes 1,000 US dollars for Penfield to spend on her comfort and show her courtesies or see that they occur without embarrassing Penfield officially. Quite a job. Penfield was quite talkative uh, towards Maurice Bunsen, whom he was acquainted with from the time when Bunsen represented England at the Viennese court. But of course, since Austria and England were at war now, this letter was sent to London. Penfield deplored the activities of one British journalist with the name Aud Aubrey Stanhope, who wrote for Vienna's Neue Freie Presse. But Mr. Pen Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Penfield, was an effective and efficient networker, befriended with the owner and editor of the paper, and even received his apologies when Stanhope re described in an article Lansing as a lawyer of mediocre abilities and Wilson as a weak doctrinaire of Scotch descent. Finally, when Stanhope planned to write about the idea that Wilson deliberated the entry of the US into the war because in that case the election would be cancelled and his term automatically prolonged, Penfield succeeded in banning this man from further publishing in this paper. There is still more Penfield correspondence available. One recipient is journalist friend Henry Watterson, at the, color, at the Courier Journal in Louisville, Kentucky. On March 24, 1916, obviously, further down, Angela, please, for the postcards. <laughs> oh, 
Penfield is delighted how well his work seems to be regarded in this monarchy, never too friendly with America. There are also vacation postcards of October 3, 1915, with a war photograph on the backside, Unsere Truppen in Felde, and of October 22, 1914, with a pretty view of Traunsee, Gmunden, Schlossort, in lovely Salzkammergut. Further down, probably? Get it? Or further up? Sorry. There it is. You might, some, some might recognize it. <laughs> Both stamped in Vienna, one respectively nine days later. The car of 1914 must have been further delayed because of two factors. It was directed via Italy, and it carries the censorship stamp, überprüft. Another friend corresponding with Penfield is John B Bassett Moore, also Republican. The file in the Library of Congress, Moore Papers, commences with a uh, probably the best moment right now. I would like to thank the Library of Congress for, <laughs> for, the, for the service they provide. It's astonishing. It, it's, it's really unbelievable. Uh, European Reading Room plus Manuscript Division, really everybody. Thank you. <laughs> the file in the Library of Congress commences with the Penfield letter of January 4, 1915. Penfield admits of homesickness, lack of men and women of our class, not enough appreciation and encouragement from the department. War broke in a violence that might have swept novices from their feet, but we rose to the occasion. Lots of expenses due to circumstances of the war, and for 17 months I have not been absent from my post. Penfield is naturally getting little of the poetry of diplomatic life. <laughs> and as we know from other occasions, from other writing occasions, I have never had a press clock. On December 2nd, he reiterates the public publicity stigma. At times I fear I have been too conservative in not encouraging publicity. It was my promise to Wilson not to be much in the papers. If I have failed at all, it is in permitting the stars and stripes to be taken down over the, over the American bar at the Bristol Hotel and the Bulgarian flag substituted therefor. A convent in, Vienna sub in a Vienna suburb shelters a kind of farm couldn't find out which one it was, a cow and hens on behalf of the embassy. Of course, on Thanksgiving, three or four of them lost their being for a dinner at the embassy with music afterwards. Where else may one find anything about America's last ambassador to the ailing court at, of Vienna? One US dissertation deals with American embassies in belligerent Europe. Bell, the author, 1983, University of Iowa. It has a prominent supervisor, Lawrence Gelfand, author of the only book, On the Inquiry. The group of experts, Wilson and early 17, asked House to gather in preparation for the upcoming peace conference. Chapter 9 of this dissertation has the title Frederick C. Penfield and the Vienna Embassy, 1914 to 1918, which is in itself questionable as relations were terminated in 1917. And unfortunately, not the only bug. What Bell describes as the most blatant reporting error, that there will be fewer small governments in Europe when the war is over, actually results from his earlier comments, which were quite common thoughts at that time, that Austria on a federalist basis would integrate most of the small Balkan states. To be true, the ambassador was less sensitive to dissensions among the nationalities which made up the Habsburg domain, but he noticed intensified conflicts among the minorities. What he did neither notice nor report was any threat breaking up because of war-generated racial tensions. On top of all, Bell would have liked Penfield to meet with dissident ethnic leaders in Austria. Vienna would have been delighted to be offered such an opportunity to take revenge for Dumba's expulsion. The term ended in a rift. Penfield seemed to have a short Janine of uh, the uh, Austrian Foreign Secretary of Tarnowski's reception, that was the designated new ambassador, uh, Tarnowski's reception by Wilson. It never was received by Wilson. Um, when this idea was turned down and Penfield recalled, he not only disconnected the two moves, but spoke openly, not only, to the local press, thus saving his face. With him, embassy and consular staff, with uh, many pieces of heavy luggage left town and country. 
A further approved list of 48 American citizens with 70 items of luggage went on the embassy of embassy's official train, among them a private couple named Stomborough, here listed. Um, of course, Margaret Stomborough is the sister of Ludwig Wittgenstein, with two sons and servants, as well as one group of Red Cross and another of YMCA people. At that moment, the U.S. entertained a network of diplomats in eight locations scattered over the dual monarchy. Uh, consulate in Budapest, <laughs> but also a consulate in Karlsbad, for example. <clears throat> in a handwritten note to Chernin, dated April 8, 1917, the U.S. Embassy, uh, represented by Gru, acknowledged the receipt of the Austrian note of the same day by which relations broke up and of the passports. The U.S. Ex exodus from Vienna was painted in a quite different light by a journalist Schreiner of the Dearborn Independent. First, Penfit sulked because of Tarnowski's mishap, then he orchestrated his departure as a simple recall, and finally he avenged himself on Gru by having him pick up the passports. According to Schreiner, the Department of State by then only trusted two persons in the Vienna staff, Stewart and Bingham. On the other hand, that was a recent uh, uh, result of my research, just for one week a special envoy took large in Vienna whose single duty might have been to wrap up things quickly. Elis Loring Dresel, he's also in this list, but just for one single week uh, he was uh, later to play an important role in Germany and Berlin. Rumors had it that Gru was connected to the pro-ally Morgan clan and destined to replace Penfield. It cannot come as a surprise then that Gru characterized Penfield as described by West. Is it possible that Penfield's meager reviews derive from his political stigmatization? He was considered a political appointee, but even then he may have been doing a good job. Did he just have bad luck being sent to Dead End Street, Vienna? The monarchy played a small role in the conflict right at the beginning and at the end when she collapsed. Remarkable was the lack of reports on national disputes in the monarchy. Overall, Mr. Penfield must be evaluated at least above average of America's envoys. His widespread correspondence proves diplomatic abilities, financial generosity, and fine, almost British humor in addressing issues. What else can one expect? Thank you. Thanks, Angela. Can we have time for questions? about the postcard that had the word Uber, something, the word censored on, on it? Überprüft. Uber. Checked. Um, how extensive was the censorship um, bureaucracy of the Austrians, or was this just a wartime measure that they had? Basically a wartime measure. Basically. As soon as the war started, they... Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, one thing that is uh, mostly overseen is that um, the the Austrian parliament was was not sitting when the war started, but it was not because of censorship or anything, but because the, the, the parliament, as Mark Twain has uh, reported from Vienna uh, some years ago, uh, was a tumultuous uh, arena. So the emperor just closed it down in March 1914 because it didn't work, but it was not nothing else. Why he didn't recall the parliament for the, for the Outbreak of the war is another issue, but no, the uh, it was it was basically a, a war measure. Harsh, but <laughs> any other questions? I have a question. I didn't hear very much about the communication of the U.S. government through him to the Kaiser on um, what the U.S. policies were, how. You know, the U.S. perceived what was going on. Um, is there documentation on that, or I mean, is the correspondence between different diplomats, <coughs> or is this not available? Well, uh, Penfield was not very popular in Washington. Uh, wasn't trusted by by Lansing too much. Mm -hmm. They did, ha did have a difficult relationship. Mm -hmm. So whenever there was something going on between Washington and Vienna. Uh, 
they tried to talk to the Austrian representatives in Washington. Um, Mr. Twidinek, he was the Austrian representative at the time when Bumba was uh, expulsed. Uh, he had a good relationship with Lansing, so Lansing most, mostly turned to, uh, to uh, Twidinek. And they, they, the, the Americans also liked uh, Tarnowski, uh, but uh, when Tarnowski came in the, in the spring of 17, the Germans started the unlimited submarine uh, campaign. And so there was no way they would uh, Wilson would receive Tarnowski anymore. Uh, there was uh, uh, one moment when when uh, uh, Penfield could have risen to some importance in the in the in the history of the war, when the Americans tried desperately to separate Austria from Germany, and there were I think four secret meetings between Penfield and uh, Foreign Secretary Janine. Uh, but uh, in the longer version of the paper, I had it more in more details. But uh, Penfield was not well informed by Washington why, uh, what was the goal of the meeting. And uh, uh, Chianin suspected that the Americans were abused by the British and the, and the French uh, for a, a proposal to uh, come to a separate peace. But it, it, uh, uh, that was not true because it was a genuine American initiative. Uh, not supported by supported, but not initiated by by the real enemies of Austria. I mean, there was no there was no real war between the U.S. and and Austria-Hungary, as you might be aware. Uh, just in the end, a couple of shots were fired on the Western Front when the America when the Germans asked the Austrians to uh, move some troops from the Southern and Eastern Front to the Western Front. In a document I found in the State Archive in Vienna, uh, Chernin, the, Aust the Austrian Foreign Secretary, uh, muttered in the, in this paper that. We are, we are do, what we are doing with America is a paper war, papier krieg. It, it's mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. How did you get interested in, in this particular <coughs> diplomat, or are you covering more thoroughly the relationships between this country and, and the empire? Not anymore. Uh, not anymore. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, I must add that my wife is American. Uh, she's okay. from Minnesota, uh, and oh. that uh, why I keep. I chose the, the topic of emigration uh, in the first place. And in, in dealing with the emigration thing, then it more or less uh, gradually uh, I, I passed on the interest to the First World War. Because uh, what was so astounding is if you if you go, for example, what we did, did we do, we, we went to a, an office in a uh, town hall in New Ulm, Minnesota. Uh, to, to check immigration uh, papers. And you, you saw all people, kinds of people from Bohemia, Upper Austria, Lower Austria, but there was no Austria as such when the people came in. So it makes you think, and I'm sure you're aware of the refugee crisis in Europe right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do we treat those people that come? How were the Austrians treated 100 years ago when they came to Ellis Island? And all, all. So it circled all around in the end to what I'm doing now, the relationship between the US and Austria. I Hungary. wish you would have another talk on that whole immigration thing at that time. And you know, like Maybe. you said, until yeah. 1930. Because I have met so many people from all of the various countries. And invariably, you know, where, where your parents are, doesn't, doesn't come up in a discussion about Austria-Hungary, but it, it just comes up like, what is your background? Oh, we we were Austro-Hungarian. We'll really check, but we were yeah. all one. <laughs> and then somebody else would say, oh, uh, I, oh, I went to the dedication of the Hungarian chapel last year, and I met uh, an old uh, Franciscan coming down the driveway, and mm. I said, were you at the dedication? Are you Hungarian? Oh, no, I'm Slovakian, but we were all one. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> That's what he said. He said we all knew Hungarian. Yeah. So it, it was very impressive. So it's interesting to me how... These people did identify themselves yeah. as Austria-Hungary, even though we hear about all of the conflicts. Yeah, they, they happened in the monarchy. Uh, supposedly, some happened in the states as well. Uh, that's mm -hmm. why the the government wanted they didn't like the hyphenates. Uh, they didn't like these hyphenates, uh, as you know. And uh, in the end, the first world, and that is the bridge between migration and and the, and, and the current topic is because actually the, the first world were helped to cover up this problem because uh, they were, uh, as you know, uh, Russians, Jews, uh, I don't know, Germans, uh, Irish in America, and the war covered everything up. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, yeah. Yes. And my question was at the end of, the, of my thesis was, uh, I hope we don't need another war to solve this problem. Yes, that's a good one. <laughs>
Not a good one, no. Yeah, <laughs> a, good, a good point. I, I confess I'm not a, a scholar or an academic. I'm just an ordinary American and don't often have a chance to speak to an Austrian historian, so I hope you allow this question, which is a little broader than, uh, than your topic. You spoke of the friendship of Ambassador Penfield and his wife with the new Emperor Carl and the Empress Zita. Yep. Um, at St. Mary's Church in Chinatown here in D.C. is a shrine to the Emperor Charles, who was beatified by Pope John Paul That's right, years yeah. ago. I wonder how um, that event, that beatification, yeah. was looked on in Austria. Um, and I also ask your opinion. I, I, I wonder whether or not you consider the Emperor Carl to have been an admirable figure. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> how long do you... <laughs> uh, well, he was an unhappy figure, wasn't he? I mean, unhappy, very unhappy. He could have achieved so much, and he achieved practically nothing. So he was not well prepared enough to take over. He was, he was good will, had good will, he, he wanted peace and stuff like that, but how he, how he tried to, to make it was... Not professional, probably. It's, uh, it's difficult to answer this question. Uh, I don't know if beatification is a good idea anyway. <laughs> uh, I'm, I've been raised as a Catholic, but I left the church a long time ago, so it's no use to talk about Catholic uh, things like that. But uh, where is this in Paris church? I would like to go there. Where is it? Um, it's at the corner of 5th and H, which is oh, yeah. about halfway between the Capitol and the White House. Yeah. It's next to the Fifth. General Accounting Office, which covers that whole block with the corner, with Fifth the exception of that I'll, old I'll German. go there. I'll go there. It's a German language. It was founded as a German language. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I think you have a comment to make related to your comment, and that is, in the United States, when people come from abroad, uh, the question often is, are you a Czech, are you a Serb, are you a whatever? So I came to the U.S. when I was 16, and I did consider myself Yugoslav. So when I arrived here, I would say I'm from Yugoslavia. And the next question was always, well, are you a Serb, are you a Serb? <laughs> and so, so I think this is something that is a legacy of immigration to the United States. People come here because perhaps earlier generations have come because of wars, because they are, you know, did not agree with some other uh, uh, nationality. But people in Europe may have a different take on who they are in general. Just a comment. Okay. Than people here. Than people here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Well, I'd like to thank the speaker for a wonderful, very interesting talk and enlightening talk. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.